Hi there, this is Mitchell Farmer and I'm here to discuss part two of Laboratory 3. Um, basically what I've pulled up here is an anterior view of the biliary system or what I've stripped down to look like the biliary system. And that's what I'm going to start with reviewing. The first thing I want to talk about is the common hepatic duct. Now the common hepatic duct is actually a union of the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct. It might be hard for you to to find those things though because as you can see I've chopped out a section of liver here and those tend to be intrahepatic so you might be able to find the common hepatic duct but not those. Now the other duct of interest is the cystic duct. The cystic duct originates from the gallbladder and joins the common hepatic duct. So the cystic duct joining the com common hepatic duct to form the common bile duct. Now if the cystic duct is blocked a patient will not appear jaundice because bile can still drain freely from the liver into the duodenum. And if it is blocked by a gallstone, this is known as cholelithiasis, which usually results in cholecystitis, so inflammation of the gallbladder from a secondary to a stone obstructing the cystic duct. Now, the common bile duct selected here, once again a union of the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct, travels inferior and if I rotate around to the posterior view travels inferior and posterior to the head of the pancreas alongside the proper hepatic artery and the portal vein to form the um, portal triad so hepatic portal artery proper hepatic or sorry proper hepatic artery hepatic portal vein and the common bile duct form the portal triad as we previously discussed when we were talking about the epiploic foramen of Winslow now, a blockage of the common bile duct by gallstone is known as cholidocolithiasis. Um, it can be blocked by a stone, as I previously said, or it can be blocked by a disease of the pancreas. Because it passes so closely inferior to the head of the pancreas, something like, say, pancreatitis or a pancreatic tumor um, can block the common bile duct. And that's why a large, non-tender gallbladder can be a sign of pancreatic cancer. And as you'll learn in physical examination, a large non-tender gallbladder is known as curvossier sign. Now the common bile duct opens up into the second part of the duodenum, and there's a whole lab covering the duodenum and the small intestine that I'll discuss with you later, but essentially it opens up into the duodenum via the major duodenal papilla. Now, the next thing I want to discuss is the celiac trunk the blood supply of the upper GI tract, essentially. I'm just going to pull it up here. Voila. Okay, so this is an anterior view. We have the descending aorta, aorta of the abdomen. The diaphragm would be approximately here. I've chopped the liver up, so only really two segments are remaining. Then we have the esophagus to the stomach into the segments of the duodenum. What we have here is the abdominal aorta and what we have coming off of it a short stumpy thing is known as the celiac trunk now the celiac trunk might be really hard to find in your cadaveric dissection and in fact in my dissection it pretty much didn't exist the common hepatic artery the left gastric artery and the splenic artery um, which are the three branches of the celiac trunk in my cadaver they basically came right off the aorta so have a look out for that if you're having trouble finding the celiac artery but the first branch I want to talk about of the celiac artery is the common hepatic artery. Now the common hepatic artery itself has two major branches. It has the proper hepatic branch and the gastroduodenal branch. Starting with the proper hepatic branch, the proper hepatic branch supplies the liver and the gallbladder. It has the left hepatic, right hepatic, and right gastric arteries. Here I have the right branch or the right hepatic and the left hepatic as you can see by the stump here has been removed so we can better visualize the structures but as you can see the right hepatic helps supply the liver but it also gives off the cystic artery which supplies the gallbladder and then as I said before there is also its final branch the right gastric which supplies the right side of the stomach's lesser curvature. Recall that this is left lesser curvature, sorry, this is the right gastric, 
coming off the proper hepatic, which comes off the common hepatic. And recall that this is the lesser curvature of the stomach and this is the greater curvature of the stomach. And as I said, the gastric artery supplies the right side of the stomach's lesser curvature, that being the model's right side. And it anastomoses with the left gastric, which is one of the branches, one of the main branches of the celiac trunk. But before discussing that, I'd like to discuss the second large branch of the common hepatic artery, which is the gastroduodenal. I have selected here. It travels posterior or deep to the first part of the duodenum. So this is the duodenum, kind of, I'll select both parts, but this is it here. And this is the first part. And as you can see, I'm just gonna take off multi-select mode. As you can see, the gastroduodenal artery travels posterior to it. And since the first part of the duodenum is often subject to ulceration for through peptic ulcer disease, in um, extreme circumstances, ulceration can burn right through the duodenal wall, and this artery, the gastroduodenal, will be at risk of rupturing, in which case you'd have kind of a sanguinating hemorrhage. Now, there are several branches of the gastroduodenal artery. There is the pancreatical, pancreaticoduodenal, sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful, um, the superior pancreatical duodenal that is, and this supplies the foregut portion of the duodenum and pancreas, or the pancreatic head selected here. And it anastomoses with the inferior pancreatical duodenal, which is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery. So here's the inferior pancreatical duodenal, and here is the superior, which anastomoses with the inferior, and is a branch of the gastroduodenal artery. The second branch of the gastroduodenal artery that's of interest is the right gastroepiploic artery. And this provides blood supply to the greater omentum, which isn't here, and the greater curvature of the stomach, as previously outlined. And it anastomoses with the left gastroepiploic artery, which I will discuss shortly. But first, the left gastric artery. So as you may guess, the left gastric artery anastomoses with the right gastric artery, and it provides blood to the lesser curvatures of the stomach, as well as the abdominal portion of the esophagus, seen here. And the final and third branch of the celiac trunk I want to discuss is the splenic artery. For that, I'm going to move my model so that we are looking at a posterior view as opposed to an anterior view. And you can see that the splenic artery is a large tortuous artery traveling along the superior border of the pancreas. So this is the superior border of the pancreas and you can see it is quite tortuous and it will be likely in your cadaveric dissection. Um, I guess as, as a note, in the cadaver, it can be also partially or completely embedded in the body of the pancreas. So look up for that. And it supplies the spleen, stomach and pancreas and it has several branches. It has the short gastric arteries, which supply the fundus of the stomach. If you recall, that's this upper portion that can be filled with air and seen on a radiograph. As well as it also gives off the left gastroepiploic artery, which if I rotate lateral and then anteriorly, we can see it wraps around the tail of the pancreas here and anastomoses with the right gastroepiploic artery. Okay. So that's a really quick review of the celiac blood supply. Um, if you didn't get it all at once, just review the video or have a look at netters. They do a good job of it as well. The last thing I want to talk about in regards to lab three is the portal venous system, which I'll pull up here. So um, one of the things that Dr. Olivia wanted me to discuss before I go into the portal venous system is that I'm going to be talking about just the portal venous um, veins, but there are several important anastomoses or shunts between the portal venous system and the inferior vena cava or the systemic circulation. And these shunts are important for a lot of different pathologies. There's five of them, and I encourage you to go to lecture, look up in the dissector, and kind of get a better idea of, of what they do and how they're important to the anatomical picture because when I was making this model, I found them very hard to um, show and, and kind of demonstrate to the best ability. So I'm going to leave that to the cadaveric dissector 
um, dissection, sorry, the dissector as well as lecture. And I'm just going to quickly talk about some of the major veins of the portal venous system. The first one I wanted to talk about being the inferior mesenteric vein. So as we'll discuss later, the inferior mesenteric vein drains the portion of the gut derived from the hindgut. Um, one of its branches, the superior rectal, which I've highlighted here, anastomoses with other rectal veins to drain into the inferior vena cava, as I was talking about, but isn't seen here. And in cases of portal hypertension, which is essentially when you have back pressure in the hepatic portal vein or the whole hepatic portal system, and you can imagine blood, just zooming in here, flowing backwards through these veins because the veins are valveless in the portal system, it would cause all sorts of problems. And one of the problems it could cause is you can imagine blood flowing backwards, backwards through the inferior mesenteric, through the superior rectal, and then you can get internal hemorrhoids, which can result in blood in the stool. One of the things that you might see in someone with liver failure and a cirrhotic liver resulting in then in portal hypertension. The next one I want to talk about is the superior mesenteric vein. As you can see, it has many branches because it drains um, basically the whole gut derived from the embryonic midgut, which is a lot um, basically most of the small intestine and the large intestine. Now, portal hypertension in regards to the superior meson mesenteric can result in ascites. Basically, you have so much back pressure that these veins and these smaller veins coming off the superior mesenteric have fluid leaking out of them and filling the abdomen with fluid, and this is known as ascites. And this anastomosis with the if we just follow the superior mesenteric vein up, it goes over the third section of the duodenum here, or duodenum, sorry, and then it goes behind the pancreas, and it anastomoses at the hepatic portal vein along with the splenic vein. Now the splenic vein, as I said, joins up with the superior mesenteric um, around the level of L1 or L1, L2 roughly, which is the transpyloric plane, if you recall, to form the portal vein. Now, much like I've talked about several times before, you can get back pressures through the splenic vein during portal hypertension, and it can engorge the spleen, resulting in splenomegaly. So if someone has a large palpable spleen in the picture of you know, liver failure or, cir or liver cirrhosis, you could suspect portal hypertension as one of the suspects. And then here's the portal vein, here's the inferior vena cava. I'm just gonna rotate back anteriorly here. One of the last things I wanted to show you was the gastric veins, the left gastric vein and the right gastric vein, both of which drain into the hepatic portal vein before it enters the liver, which you can't really see here because I've removed lobes of the liver. But the important thing about especially the left gastric vein is that the left gastric vein has esophageal veins that drain into it or anastomosis with esophageal veins, which are then, then drain into the azygous vein. But if you have increased back pressure from the hepatic portal vein through the gastric vein, through the esophageal vein, you can get the esophageal veins engorging, and this is, results in something known as esophageal varices. Esophageal varices are big engorged veins that are easy to rupture and thus are easy to bleed and this can result in the patient vomiting up blood, which is a pretty serious situation. And so I guess those are kind of some of the anatomic considerations in regards to, you know, portal hypertension in the portal um, venous system. Basically, all the blood or lots of the blood of the abdomen first drains into the portal system, goes through the liver before then entering the inferior vena cava. And since those veins are valveless, and since the liver can cause back pressure, among other things, liver being the most common, you can get all of those different pathologies that I discussed. Now, um, this is a pretty tricky concept for some people, so I recommend looking at some other resources and all, especially looking up those, those different shunts connecting um, various portal system veins to the systemic system via the inferior vena cava, looking up those five connections. Oh, there's five shunts. Um, so yeah, so that's everything for Lab 3. It was a doozy, um, but I hope you enjoyed the videos. Thanks.